that are uh, in some way downstream to uh, uh, a lot of the glyphosate from, from uh, genetically modified fields and farms, um, other kinds of neurotoxins, and possibly they've been exposed to a lot of GMOs. So viruses are, are now manifesting characteristics and strengths that they never had before. Um, and interfering with, 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 with the way that other viruses actually are able to function. So it, uh, it's, it's, it's intriguing that when we start to play with, with things for one kind of end, uh, we, we can never really predict what we're getting ourselves into. So, <clears throat> but that's, the, that's the, the, basic, that's the basic idea that, um, that, 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 that comes into play. So when we look at GMOs, for instance, and I, I say to myself, what, what is really potentially going on here? You know, where, where could it impact on the body's systems? Uh, I think the, the, the natural starting point is to say, well, let's take something like, what, what, what's on the common genetically modified kind of things that, that are out there that people are exposed to? What's the big one in South Africa? Yeah, maize and corn. Uh, maize and corn. Maize and corn. Yeah. Yeah. Soy. Yeah. Soy. Soy. Maize corn. Yeah. Cotton seeds. Yeah. And most a lot of the seeds. Um, Is that wheat? Yeah. Probably. Probably. Yeah. Uh, food additives in most processed foods. Yeah. 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 Many a lot of those are. Well. Yeah. yeah. A lot of those are made by wonderful little genetically modified. Um, Organisms genetically modified bacteria that become slaves to produce um, artificial sweeteners like uh, components of aspartame. Um, they can produce good things like insulin for diabetics. So E. coli is, is genetically modified to make insulin. Like a lot of food additives, etc., preservatives are GMO, GMO based. And I think the, the real fallout is that. Um, we are now eating a huge amount of um, organisms or foods or additives, etc., that contain uh, altered, altered bacterial sequencing. Um, often, that uh, the, 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 the genetically modified trait will be, be coming from a bacteria, and so the biggest fallout that 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 we might see with uh, with the GMOs is, is here in terms of the gut. Um, <clears throat> because of the interaction between the bacterial genes and our gut bacteria. So I think there's one of the big, one of the big issues. And when they look at the database of, of health problems over the last 30 or 40 years, and look at the, the kind of the curve as far as GMOs are concerned, and the consumption of GMOs, and one of the things that correlates very strongly are gut problems. Um, there's about 22 diseases that correlate very strongly, but gut problems come come first and you know sort of front and center. Uh, one of the problems with, uh, with with your with your gut bacteria is that they they and, and all bacteria in in, in in a sense is that they're very generous in sharing information. So if you have a bacterial-based toxin, and that's in something like the corn, so the Bt toxin that uh, that essentially makes the corn uh, uh, resistant to uh, little creatures that want to eat it. So it's the corn's own pesticide. Uh, unfortunately, then that particular gene, bacterial gene, where that bacteria, where that gene was taken from, that bacterial gene, can interact with your gut bacteria and can potentially turn your gut bacteria into a, 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 a toxin generating bacteria itself. So <coughs> Let me rewind and just summarize it. <coughs> in corn, you've generally got two, two genes that are altered. One is uh, the gene to make the corn resistant to Roundup. So you can spray as much pesticide as, uh, herbicide as you like on the plant. And then second, it's a gene to, uh, to allow the corn to make a certain poison. That when an insect eats that corn, that insect dies. So the corn makes its own pesticide. Again, that gene will interact with the gut. With our gut bacteria's bacterial genes, and the next minute our gut bacteria are potentially making a pesticide-like poison. 
which can cause a huge amount of inflammation in the gut. So that can be one of the ways. So we see, we see a lot of gut problems. Um, and when the gut bacteria are out of balance, uh, a whole host of, of cascades come into play. So there's, there's fairly good evidence because bacterial genes from GMO products have been detected in human beings. They've been detected in the blood of human beings. They've been detected in... Uh, in the in, in the in the in in, a, in the fetuses, they've been detect detected in newborns of mothers who are detected in the blood of the mother. It's already passed on to the newborn child. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> so, so we know that there, there is definite sharing between the genetically modified um, uh, foods, etc., and our own little bacterial genes. So when we upset the gut, we lay ourselves open for things like allergies, autoimmune diseases, um, all kind of inflammatory, uh, inflammatory fallout. But when our gut bacteria are upset or they're doing the wrong thing, and uh, when they're making things that are causing more inflammation in the gut, that inflammatory <coughs> process in and of itself is extremely stressful for the body. And then we start to see a fallout in terms of the body's ability to maintain the levels of energy that it needs to uh, keep all the other processes on track. Um, so how many people do you know nowadays who suffer from fatigue? It's almost like an epidemic. And I think GMOs and, and, and some of the herbicides that are overused in the GMO environment can directly be blamed for that because of the stress that they're putting on the body systems. <coughs> Excuse me, we all know that allergies have gone through the roof. Um, we all know, uh, certainly in terms of, of gut problems, every second person is allergic to some kind of food. I can't eat this, I can't eat that, I've got stomach problems, I've got irritable bowel. Um, you know, what is our, what's happening here in terms of exposure? Because uh, we, we, we can identify certain things that have changed in our environment. And one of the big ones is, is the increase in in the consumption of the genetically modified um, crops and, and, and foods. Not to mention um, sources of GMO that you're not even aware that you're being exposed to the GMOs. So many supplements are made from genetically modified, in, in a, from, from genetically modified bacteria in the laboratory. Um, I'll, I'll pick up a slide for one of them, but, but there was a huge fallout and, and, and one of the supplements um, really very useful supplement was pulled off the market because people actually died from, from taking it. And then they realized that it was uh, a problem with a little bacteria that was making the supplement. Um, there was some real kind of cross-reactivity and because this, the supplement is based on, again, a genetically modified process. So uh, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of risks. I think we have to also look at the risk What's the risk of having GMOs in a lab where they can't get out versus having GMOs in the food, food chain where it's everywhere? And maybe in the lab where someone's making sure they don't get out, that's a good thing. But uh, now, now you know, someone would say, well, um, I eat organic, I, I grow my own vegetables, etc., etc. Am I exposed? You know, actually, everyone's exposed because it's everywhere. And if the GMOs aren't everywhere, or uh, the, certainly the glyphosate that is overused is everywhere. It's in the air, it's in the rainwater, um, it's in the soil for decades. So what was someone spraying on your, on your front lawn um, 30 years ago? Because it might still be there, or where you've now decided to put your veggie patch. And we'll talk about how do, how do people presume that we'll, we'll restore things. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, so we're seeing breakdown in, in the digestive system. We're seeing breakdown in the body's ability to maintain a balance in terms of inflammation. Uh, when we look at so many of the chronic illnesses, they all come back to the gut. And so anything that affects the gut is, is absolutely huge. Uh, this is just, uh, again, an interesting, uh, very old um, note in the New York Times where they're saying that Again, you, you can't say that genes operate independently. So we don't actually know what the, what the overall fallout in terms of the genetic, modif genetic modification process, what they actually are. But uh, 
And whenever someone says, what is the real safety, what are the real risks, you, you kind of told that you're, you know, sort of heretic and you're sitting on the fringe and, and, and you're crazy. <coughs> so, uh, so that's really not true, actually. Um, we should be asking these questions. When I was, before I studied medicine, I, I, I had a strong interest in physiology and we were in a lab where uh, we designed a very interesting kind of toxicology um, testing methodology. So we, we could essentially look at, uh, at uh, the effects of any substance on the ability of, this, of, of any cell to make energy. It was a very, very nifty little, little study design that we did within the lab. And my, my supervisor, the professor in that lab, was a really bright woman. Um, and she, she actually was part of the team that had been no, nominated for a Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering the hormone um, calcitonin. And so she was uh, seriously bright, and, and we had a fantastic time. And it was just at the time when Candorel came on the market, so aspartame. And uh, she said, well, why don't we look at this? Because it's new, you know, this hasn't been around. And we thought, fantastic. And, uh, and we, I mean, I didn't even think about these kinds of things. But every time we exposed uh, liver cells to Candorel, they just literally went to sleep. And uh, it, it bothered me. I mean, I, I spent a couple of years doing postgraduate research in physiology, um, and it really bothered me that we could never get that information any, anywhere, anywhere. And whenever I <coughs> would take someone on about aspartame, they'd come with all these studies that said it was okay. And I'm like, I've seen with my own eyes it's not okay. And this was not willy-nilly science. This was high-class research done by very enthusiastic, clever people. And... Uh, that was kind of a turning point for me in terms of do not trust big food, do not trust big pharma, do not trust big anything. Because clearly there's another agenda. <laughs> and that's so uh, unfortunately I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not the person who, who my colleagues sort of see as an, an, an easy win over. And I learned from there that you've got to ask questions because if you don't, um, no one's going to ask them for you. And, but your health is going to be at risk. So. Uh, so that was important for me. And later on, I realized, yeah, what, what were we really dealing with there? You know, components of aspartame are coming from genetically modified organisms. <coughs> the GMO aspect, is it the aspartame itself? You know, what, what's actually going on? And to this day, there's still this denial that, that, that aspartame is, is, is a problem. But interestingly, Pepsi is pulling it from their soft drinks because they've had about a 5% drop in, in, in their diet drinks because people simply will refuse to drink a product that has aspartame in it. And they, they say openly that they're doing it because people are not drinking their products and they'll sell more if they put an alternative sweetener in. Um, but they're saying that this, is, this fear of aspartame is based on pseudoscience but they have to bow to it. They'll still call it pseudoscience but they'll take it off because it means money to them. And so that, the other lesson that we have to learn is that we have to stop buying stuff that's not okay for us. So that these companies just realize that it's going to hit their bottom, their bottom line and they'll only change for that reason. Or unless the government forces them to change. But again, the government, how, how come we can't stop or, 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 or deal with smoking or alcohol or other things that are bad for us? Don't get me started on alcohol. <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, <coughs> but anyway, um, the glyphosate issue is really... Interesting. So glyphosate is a component in, 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 in is the active component in Rana. You guys heard of glyphosate? You've heard of Rana? You know Rana? Rods, whatever. Um, what, what is glyphosate? What does it do? Do you guys, have you heard anything about what it actually does? Um, no, it's the first time I've heard about it just this week. Okay. It was actually right. invented to clean, um, like scale off of um, yeah. industrial pipes. <coughs> Exactly. Yeah, it was a descaling agent. Let's <laughs> eat that. Yummy. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it was initially invented, and, and the, the, the sister part, there's Roundup and there's something called Liberty. It's the same family. Um, they were fantastic descaling, descaling uh, agents. So they are what we call chelators. They trap minerals. So you have all this calcium scale in a, in a big vat. And you pour the stuff in, and it traps the calcium, and you can rinse your vat out, and it's nice and shiny and clean again. So it's a potent chelator. 
it's, a, it's what we would call a, a very broad spectrum chelator as well. So originally designed to clean stuff, <coughs> and then it was um, repurposed as a herbicide because plants need minerals. So pretty easy. Let's trap all the minerals, and then the plant will die because it can't survive without those essential minerals which are essential nutrients. So that's essentially how glyphosate kills plants. Now the problem is if you spray glyphosate on a field, it kills everything. So Monsanto got the, 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 <coughs> their hands on glyphosate, and then they decided, well, this could be very interesting. What if we could find a way to make a crop that was resistant to glyphosate, we'd kill all the, all the, all the weeds, this crop would resist, um, and we'll own both of them, so we can sell the glyphosate and the GMO thing and you know, make a fortune, which they have. <coughs> and of course, you know, Monsanto makes aspartame too, so, so they're, they're in it big time. Um, and so it became, it became the, it was always a, a very popular herbicide, but it became a herbicide of choice when you started to look at GMO, um, corn, soy, alfalfa, um, most of the GMO crops. So the fallout there is that if you trap a mineral for the GMO plant, you trap the minerals for anything else that's going to go into that field. You trap the minerals for the, the, the soil microbes. So all those important little guys who should be basically um, creating more soil, decomposing things, and keeping the soil in the right state to make healthy plants. So those little microbes will die. And what happens is that there's often a fungal overgrowth in the soil. So now the fungi aren't as badly affected. And also the fungal overgrowth is not good fungi. It's some of the bad fungi that produce some serious toxins when they get their metabolism working. And one of the, one of the problems with some of the fungal mycotoxins, or, or what we call fungal toxins, mycotoxins, uh, in this context is that they they're, they're actual hormone mimickers. So they, they upset the reproductive hormones um, in animals. Because these fungi then get into the plant, and the mycotoxins get into the plant. The animals might eat that plant, and, uh, and that upsets the fertility of those animals. It also upsets the fertility of human beings if you're going to be eating a GMO, a GMO um, crop to any, to any large degree. <coughs> so those <coughs> mycotoxins have a, have a whole lot of fallout. Um, and one of the places that we find that, uh, that uh, glyphosate has a huge impact is, uh, is on your mitochondria. So your mitochondria are the little organs in your cells that make your cells energy. And uh, your cells cannot function without this interesting compound called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's the energy currency of your cells. If you don't have that, your cells can't work. They can't make stuff, they can't repair themselves, they can't do their job. And uh, you basically are eating. You're eating for your mitochondria. You're not eating for your stomach or whatever. You're eating for your mitochondria because if your mitochondria don't have nutrition, your cells stop working, all your cells. Um, and uh, when we look at all of the chronic illnesses, we can chunk them back down to mitochondrial fallout. Alzheimer's disease, infertility, ADD, autism, um, high blood pressure, you name it, I can, I can tell you how the mitochondria would be involved. It's just unbelievable. And uh, when we look at mitochondria, this is some of the things. This is a, a fraction of what's happening inside of mitochondria. But I'd like you to look at the minerals. There we go, manganese, magnesium, copper, iron, um, not to mention important B vitamins, etc. But the mitochondria need a bucket full of minerals in order to function. So the complexity of the chemistry inside of a mitochondria is not to be underestimated. Um, very nutrient dependent little organs in our cells. You trap the minerals in the soil, you trap them in, you make those minerals inaccessible in plants, um, you expose humans to glyphosate inadvertently and they trap they get their minerals trapped and chelated in their own bodies, and the mitochondria are going to grind to a halt. And so, <clears throat> when we start to talk about glyphosate, 
and we get back to these systems, glyphosate can affect absolutely every one of these. Um, because all of your cells will feel the pressure because they can't do it. They don't have energy for, to, to allow them to actually do the functions that they're, that they're meant to do. So that from the glyphosate side, what we're seeing is, is predominantly, and I think you know, these again are, 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 are trends that we're seeing from a health perspective, that we can really lay some of the blame at the door of our unfortunate exposure to glyphosate. Um, the fatigue syndromes, uh, uh, immune system breakdown, definitely uh, problems in terms of fertility. Um, and if you want to, it's an interesting exercise, if you want to understand how the health of human beings is, is affected by genetically modified um, crops and, <coughs> and products, just go and look at what's happening in the animal environment, in the animal, in the animal agriculture. Because there, people are not scared to say, you know, 50% of my pigs are infertile, 60% of my, of, my, of my cows are infertile. You know, we don't say that in, in, in polite circles as human beings, we don't talk about those things. We don't talk about health problems the way that farmers talk about their cows. But if you see all the things that are happening in, in animals, it's all happening in human beings as well. And uh, so, yeah, you, uh, you know, go to St. George's, they've got a sperm bank down there and ask the embryologist about fertility. And she'll tell you that 8% of the, of the donated sperm they throw away. Mm. So people get paid to donate sperm. 80% of it they throw it away. They say, thank you very much, please don't come back. Because the sperm is not swimming, it's swimming backward, it doesn't know where to go. It's defective, 80%. Now, where do they get their sperm from? The guys at Varsity, young, you know, the young <laughs> guys, you know, handsome guys, they're going to be sperm donors. <laughs> Seriously, I was chatting to the, to the embryologist there. She said, you will not believe how we're struggling to find sperm that actually works. <coughs> yeah, so we're not talking about stressed out executives who are like in their 30s. We're talking about people who should be reproductively at the prime of their lives. And uh, of course, if, you, if your mitochondria aren't working properly, um, you don't have the energy. You don't have the energy to grow a fetus. So women's fertility goes down the drain. And what's really interesting for me is in, in the African population, you never used to have to look at things like assisted reproduction as an African person. The, your Caucasian people did, but never, not African people. Now, it's, now African couples are needing assisted reproduction. Why? It's because of the diet. It's because of how their staple diet has been adjusted. And this is the fallout. Fallout is in cellular energy, of course, more cellular energy needed for reproduction than anything else. So kind of going back to, <coughs> to this picture. Um, when we look at so energy, we know um, your immune system is a high maintenance system, absolutely high maintenance system. So there's going to be fallout there. Uh, you know, uh, again, our question really is in, 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 in coming back to some of these interesting new diseases we have, swine flu, bird flu, etc. <coughs> These were viruses that were very puny. And now suddenly they're wiping out, I think it was over the last two years in America, they, they lost like 64,000 chickens, you know, and, and turkeys uh, because of basically the bird flu. And uh, what was interesting that no organic or free range chickens died. And they said, wow, this is an interesting strain of virus. Um, no, I don't think it was an interesting strain of virus that went around and said, oh, I don't think I'll attack a free-range bird. Um, it was because of the way that the immune systems of those animals had been adjusted and increased vi virulence, potentially, in terms of that, uh, that bird flu. So, uh, I think, you know, we, we don't really realize the load that's been put on our body. So, it's, uh, a number of studies have been done just looking at what, what is in human beings. Um, you know, 700 different contaminants. You know, if you're worrying about MSG, I mean, there's about 699 other things to worry about. Um, even even um, umbilical cord blood, there was an interesting study in New York. They took uh, a group of babies born, newborns, in a New York City hospital, and they looked for chemicals Basically, again, 
um, contaminants in the in in a newborn baby. And there are over two hundred contaminants mm. in the newborn baby. So you don't even get born. You're not even born clean anymore. It's another good reason to 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 protect those mitochondria. Um, I'll just leave you with uh, with this thought. You know, we think about food as nutrition. We think about food as you know, so fill my stomach. Uh, we think about, okay, I'm going to eat for my mitochondria. But your body sees food as information. So food is information. It informs your body's chemistry in terms of telling your body to take that chemical path or this chemical path. So food is not nutrition for your body. It's information. It tells your body how to work. The wrong kind of food will confuse the chemistry and send it down the wrong pathway. Um, contaminants, etc., will do that kind of thing. Um, so again, good food is good information for the body. Bad food is bad information for the body. And I think that's 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 really one of the things that we should we should consider when we put things in our mouth. Um, are there nutrients here that are going to inform my body well? Are there things that are going to confuse my body? And of course, for many people, they're eating things they don't even know. They don't, they don't even know what these things do. You know that, that exercise of reading the labels, and if you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. Um, <laughs> If you don't recognize it, your body won't either. I mean, your body knows real food. Um, so that's one of, our, one of our other challenges, and there's no shortcut. Um, in Nicholas uh, Taleb's article on GMOs, he really takes to task this myth that, uh, that we're all going to starve if we don't have GMO crops and that this is going to save the world. He takes all of those to task from a statistical scientific perspective, not from the perspective of we're, we're emotional about it. Um, he takes it from the perspective of, is the risk real that they say there is, and is this the solution? And it's a deafening no. Um, so I think you know, there, there's, there, there's always the debate, but uh, there's enough to suggest that we need to be extremely cautious. Um, I'll maybe end with, a, with another quote. Um, <coughs> so again, he says, um, you know, labeling the GMO approach scientific, there's a warped understanding of the probabilities in risk management because it's not really, it's not scientific anymore. It might have been 50 years ago. Um, the science has changed. We know all. Um, and again, lack of observations of explicit harm does not mean that there is an absence of hidden risks. And the research is, is going to bear out the fact that we're taking big risks. I don't have to convince you guys. Good, so uh, I think uh, I've kind of lagged on for a while.